Well, good morning, Eastwood, and anybody who may be joining us this morning. I trust that you are staying well. Um, we're just here this morning uh, to uh, sort of keep some level of uh, normal, and uh, this being Sunday, um, I know many, many of you are joining together to worship the Lord this morning. So we have, Tim and I, Pastor Tim and I have just come together and we would like to uh, help you in that this morning. I'd like to thank everybody for uh, your prayers for me. Um, if you don't know, I was injured a few weeks ago. I'm recovering fine. Um, a few little setbacks here and there, but uh, I've been so encouraged to uh, have been reached out by many of you to let you know that you're praying for me. And so I thank God for that. And uh, you have been in my prayers also. Um, we're not going to uh, do things much differently this morning. I'm going to take a few minutes here for some quiet meditation as we get ready to worship the Lord this morning. Um, so if you are at home watching this, could you just join with me now for a few minutes of silent prayer? And then I will read an amazing scripture um, from uh, one of Paul's letters, and then we'll get started with our service. So join me now. going to read from 1st Thessalonians chapter 4 and sort of the background of this is many of the people in Thessalonica had been um, told that they had been, they had missed the coming of the Lord so Paul is Paul is writing to them and he writes these words we do not want you to be uninformed brothers about those who are asleep that you may not grieve as others who do who have no hope for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. And this is what I want to draw your attention to. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. And that's what we want to do this morning. We want to encourage each other. We want to be ready for the Lord's coming whenever that may be. And uh, we just want to have all comfort knowing that our Lord is in control. So we're going to do a few songs of worship here this morning with some prayer. And we're going to start with Here I Am to Worship, uh, a familiar song. And if you're at home, please feel free to sing along.
God's people to pray and to know that God hears our prayers. He hears them not because of anything we have done. He hears us because we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So please join with me and uh, let's seek our God's face. Our dear Heavenly Father, as we cease from all of our labors, help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. Give us grace, our Father, to set aside the cares and concerns that weigh upon our minds and hearts. We remember that you are God and that you alone order all things. Nations may rage, kingdoms may fall. There are wars and rumors of wars, but we know that you are in control. You are our God. You are with us. You are our protection and our strength. And our Father, we thank you for these precious truths and realities that remind us that you are always present with us in our times of trouble. Having forgiven us all our sins, we ask you this day to cleanse us from that which has defiled us. As we struggle to understand what is happening in our world with the scourge of this virus, oh, how we pray that you would help our unbelief. Give us grace, our Father, not to be anxious or fearful. Lord, we know you've commanded us to do this, and yet how often we find ourselves slipping into these sins. Oh, how we pray for grace to be still and to know that you are God. And our Father, we thank you for the reminder of your word that even though the earth melts and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, we do not need to fear. Even in our most difficult moments, we can be thankful, our Father, because of your steadfast love. Even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, the scriptures remind us that we need fear no evil because you are with us. Your rod and your staff, they comfort us. Our Father, we are so grateful for the fact that you are always with us, that you are always for us, and that as such, who can be against us? So our Father, in spite of our circumstances, regardless of our circumstances, we call upon you. We thank you, our Father, that you always hear the prayers of those who are trusting in Jesus for their salvation. You hear the prayer of repentance from the sinner. Our Father, as we think about our fellowship, we pray for our sick and our shut-ins. Father, we recognize that now they are even more alone than they were before. How we pray that you would be their help 
and their comfort, that you would protect them from this virus. We pray for their caregivers, and we ask our Father that you would help them in this time of unprecedented workload and stress. Keep them healthy, we pray. We pray for those, our Father, who struggle with mental illness and times like this can exacerbate their struggles. Oh, how we pray that you would grant them relief, that you would help them and encourage them. Our Father, we especially want to remember uh, the family of Vera Gerard, and we thank you, our Father, that even now as we seek to worship you, she looks upon the face of our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you, our Father, for the blessed hope that is realized for her. And Father, as the family grieves, how we pray that you would help them, strengthen them, and encourage them. Be their help in their time of trouble, we pray. Our Father, we ask that in these days you would help us to be even more diligent to stay connected to you. Help us, our Father, to stay connected with one another, to minister to one another to help one another, to encourage one another. Lord, we pray for those who are out of work because of this virus, because of this pandemic. We ask our Father for your gracious and kind provision for them. Help them, we pray, and provide for them. And Lord, we pray for our fellowship, our church, as we seek to continue to do the work of ministry, as we support missionaries in other countries, as we need to pay our bills here. Father, we bring these very real and practical concerns for you to you because we know that you care for us. And then, our Father, we pray for our world. We ask for wisdom and guidance and direction for our political leaders. Lord, would you help them, bless them, give them grace to make good decisions. And, Father, we Pray for our missionaries, many of whom have chosen to remain where they are and continue to minister to those that you have called them to. Lord, watch over them, keep them, and help their families here in Canada to not to be afraid and not to be anxious for them. And now, Father, as we continue in our worship this morning, would you help us to worship you in spirit and in truth? Bless Joel as he continues to lead us in song, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, our next song uh, really speaks to um, our Lord sitting on the throne and in ultimate control of all creation, all heaven and earth. So we're going to sing God of Wonders now. Oh, 
Shout your praise. 
place our hearts will cry and these bones will say without your permission, Lord. And we, as your children, we come near the Good Shepherd, Lord, for comfort, for encouragement. And Lord, as uh, Pastor Tim brings your word forth, would you just deliver on those things, Lord? Would your grace and mercy continue to abound richly in us? We pray this in your Son's holy, precious name. Amen. Thank you, Joel. What a great joy to sing God's praises. I, I trust that you've been encouraged this morning so far, and I know that uh, what we're going to look at this morning is um, going to be very encouraging as well. So if you have your Bible with you, please turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. My goal over the next few weeks is to go through passages which speak of Paul's suffering, and uh, we want to learn from him how to deal with our current situation. What should our attitude be? So we're focusing on 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and we'll be looking specifically today at verses 1 through 3. Now before we get to the passage, I just want to make some opening remarks. My first point is trouble in the world. I think we all know that trouble is an inevitable reality that all who live on the earth will face sooner or later. Eliphaz, one of Job's friends, said in Job chapter 5 and verse 7, but man is born for trouble as the sparks fly upward. Job, in his great suffering, agreed with him in Chapter 14 and verse 1, he said, Man who is born of a woman is few of days and full of trouble. The people we read about in the scriptures are a stark reminder that trouble, sorrow, pain, disappointment, and despair are never far away. And we all know this from personal experience. And to make things worse, our troubles are often made more difficult by the feeling that God is far off and distant. We hear this in the lament of the psalmist in Psalm chapter 10 and verse 1. Listen to his cry. Why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? In light of the trouble that is so common in our world, the question is often asked, why do bad things happen to good people? And to answer that question, we must first deal with the assumption that there are, in fact, any good people. According to the scriptures, there are none. Romans 3.10 says, as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. 
And Isaiah 64, verse 6 says, We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. And the reason for this is given in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And as a result, the world is under the just wrath of God. Psalm 711 says, God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. So our conclusion is that bad things happen to all people because they are sinners living in a world upon which they brought the curse of sin. So that is trouble, and we know that we all face it. Now what about trouble in the believer's life? We know that believers have been forgiven all of their sins, past, present, and future. And as a result, Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 2 remind us, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Why then do bad things happen to forgiven and redeemed believers? Well, God permits and ordains bad things in the lives of those he loves for several reasons. And I hope that as I go through these, you're going to be encouraged. And there are a number of them. There's a total of eight. I'm going to give you seven, and then we're going to focus on the last one, which comes from our passage this morning. First of all, God uses trouble to prove to us that we are true believers. In Proverbs chapter 17 and verse 3, it says, The crucible is for silver, and the furnace is for gold, and the Lord tests hearts. We need to remember that such testing is not for God's benefit. I mean, he knows all things. He, he knows who we are. He knows us better than we know ourselves. Instead, troubles reveal to those who are being tested whether their faith is in fact real. No trouble or trial or affliction, no matter how severe, can destroy genuine faith. Those whose faith is real will always pass the test that God ordains. Every time a true believer comes out of a trial, their faith is stronger and their assurance of salvation is greater. Their confidence grows and their hope matures every time they go through a trial. So God uses trouble to prove to us that we are true believers. Secondly, God uses trouble to teach us to rely on him. In Psalm chapter 118, verses 8 and 9, it says, It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. Now, brothers and sisters, we know how great a temptation it is to trust in others or to trust in things rather than to trust in the Lord. God, therefore, uses affliction to teach us to trust in him alone. Paul, who was no stranger to trouble, affirms this in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. He says, For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Their trouble was so great they wanted to die. They thought they were going to die. Verse 9, Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. So God uses trouble to teach us to rely on him. Thirdly, God uses trouble to give us a great desire for heaven. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 17 and 18, we read, For this light and momentary affliction 
is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all com comparison. And we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Brothers and sisters, the more troubles we endure in this life, the more we long for heaven. This world, brothers and sisters, is not our home. We need to remember that. The Bible describes us as sojourners, travelers. We're, we're passing through. We're on our way to heaven where we truly belong. So first, God uses troubles to prove to us, to show us uh, that we are true believers. He uses trouble to teach us to rely on him. He gives us trouble to give us a greater desire for heaven. And now fourth, God uses trouble to show us what we really love. If we love the world and the things of the world, trouble will make us angry, frustrated, or bitter, and will cause those who are not true believers to turn away from Christ. Remember Jesus' words in the parable of the sower in Matthew chapter 13, verses 20 through 22. As for that which was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while, and when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. So if we love the world and the things of the world, eventually trouble and trial and the cares of this world are going to cause us to walk away. On the other hand, if we love Christ and are seeking the kingdom of heaven and God's righteousness, listen to what Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5 tell us. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So as we go through this difficult time, it would be a good thing to ask ourselves, do we, do we truly love our God? And I think as I've been going through this, that's come to my mind. Are there things that I am really missing, that I'm regretful about, that really don't matter? causing me a lot of grief and sorrow. Maybe the Lord is showing me that I need to let those things go. They don't really matter. Well, fifthly, God uses trouble to teach us to obey him. You see, troubles remind us that we are living in a world that is cursed because of our sin. The painful experiences of trials and affliction remind us that sin has consequences. Listen to Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 11. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? So this is being addressed to believers. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. For the moment all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. 
Do you see in, these, in this passage how God's purpose in trouble is to teach us obedience, to build in us holiness and righteousness? Number six, God uses trouble to reveal his love for us. You see, trouble forces us to pray and seek after God. I don't know about you, but I know that in my troubles and trials, boy, I'll tell you, I don't, I don't think I pray as much or read my Bible as much or think about God as much as when I'm in trouble. And I have, I've had the experience that when that trouble is gone, I've, I've missed that because the trouble and the trial have driven me to the Lord. And when I don't have that trouble there anymore, I'm, I'm struggling I, I, and, I, and I want that closeness and fellowship. So trouble forces us to pray and seek after God. And as we do so and experience God's comfort, we are encouraged, renewed, and revived. Listen to Isaiah chapter 49 and verse 13. Sing for joy, O heavens, and exalt, O earth. Break forth, O mountains, into singing, for the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on his afflicted. Isn't that encouraging? This brought to my mind a, a precious hymn that I often think about. As I say the words, I'm sure the tune will come to your mind. All the way my Savior leads me, what have I to ask beside? Can I doubt his tender mercy, who through life has been my guide? Heavenly peace, divinest comfort, here by faith in him to dwell. For I know whate'er befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. For I know whate'er befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. All the way my Savior leads me, cheers each winding path I tread, gives me grace for every trial, feeds me with the living bread. Though my weary steps may falter and my soul athirst may be, gushing from the rock before me, lo, a spring of joy I see. Gushing from the rock before me, lo, a spring I see. God uses trouble to show us and teach us of his love for us. So what have we looked at so far? God uses trouble to prove to us that we are true believers. He uses trouble to teach us to rely on him. He uses trouble to give us a great desire for heaven. He uses trouble to show us what we really love. He uses trouble to teach us to obey him. He uses trouble to reveal his love for us. And then seven, God uses trouble to make us more useful. You see, the more that we are tested and refined by trials, the more we learn, the stronger we, we become, and the greater our faith becomes. All these make us more effective in our efforts to serve our Lord. James 1, 2 through 4 echoes this when it says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be what? Perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Brothers and sisters, when we are perfect and complete and lacking nothing, we are very useful to our God in the work that he has called us to. Well, the eighth thing that we're going to focus on now is that God uses trouble to equip us to comfort others. As we lean on God in our trouble and cry out to him, he helps us. He carries us. He guides us. He protects us. Sometimes we don't recognize these blessings until after the trouble is over. And we can look back and see God's hand, his unmistakable hand upon us. When others find themselves in trouble because we have been comforted in, in those times, we are able to come alongside them and comfort them out of the comfort that we have received. Now, let's read together 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God that is at Corinth with all the saints who are in the whole of Achaia, 
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. And our God, we pray that as we study your word this morning, we've already looked and uh, understood the ways in which you use trouble and trial in our lives. And Father, as we focus this morning on the comfort that you give us and that we in turn share with others, Lord, would you guide our hearts and minds into all truth? Would you strengthen us? Would you encourage us? And would you help us? Give us ears to hear and hearts to understand and wills to obey. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, first of all, I want you to notice Paul's greeting. He describes himself as an apostle of Christ Jesus. Now, an apostle was simply one who had been sent out by another, a messenger. Now, the qualifications of an apostle are given in Acts chapter 1, verses 21 through 26. We would do well to pay attention to these, especially in this day and age when uh, there is much... Um, misinformation and outright false teaching going on around apostleship. People claiming to be apostles. Well, all we need to do is hold them up to the light of God's word to understand whether or not they are indeed apostles. In Acts chapter 1, verses, verse 21, it tells us that an apostle had to be a man, a male. Any female who claims to be an apostle is then a liar, is deceived. Secondly, an apostle had to be one who went in and out amongst the disciples the whole time of Jesus' ministry from his baptism to his ascension. We see that at the end of verse 21. Brothers and sisters, there is no one alive today who meets that qualification. Thirdly, an apostle had to have been a witness to Jesus' resurrection and be able to testify to it. We see that in verse 22. Again, there isn't anyone who's been an eye, who is alive today that is an eyewitness to Jesus' resurrection. And then finally, that person had to be chosen by God himself. We see that in verses 24 through 26. It says there that uh, after the church had brought two names before the, 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 the church. Um, they then drew lots and they prayed, they fasted and they asked and God determined the person. So Paul was such a one, he was an apostle. We'll look at that briefly in a moment. Now it says that he was an apostle by the will of God. And this really highlights this last Point that we just made in the qualifications of an apostle. In Paul's case, Jesus himself had chosen him and set him apart to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. We see that in Acts chapter 9. Paul was on his way to Damascus to imprison and uh, take home captive uh, Jews who had put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. God met him on the road, knocked him down on the ground, and uh, blinded him and saved him, and then made him his, his slave to go and be an apostle to the Gentiles. Now, some of you may be saying, now what about the witnessing part? You know, that says that the mark of an apostle is one who witnessed Jesus from his baptism to his ascension. Well, we need to remember that Jesus himself unmistakably set Paul apart for ministry. 
And again, we're thinking about Acts chapter 9 here, where a vision was given to Ananias to go and anoint Paul's eyes so that he could see. And God specifically told Ananias that God had set him apart for ministry. He had chosen him. So we have an eyewitness. Then we know that Paul spent time in Arabia where the Lord taught him for three years. Now that's in Galatians chapter 1, verse 11 through chapter 2 and verse 10, where Paul describes this experience about how God led him to become an apostle. I don't know how that happened. I don't know whether the Lord appeared to him visibly or, or whether it was a vision. We don't know, but it's interesting that it was three years, the same amount of time that God had taught the other disciples. And then after that, when Paul returned to Jerusalem and, and came to the apostles and told them what had happened, those apostles affirmed him as an apostle. And then finally, we notice that Paul had been given the power to do miracles. God doesn't give the power to do miracles to fakes and phonies. Paul declared that he was an apostle. God gave him the power to do miracles, and that was God's personal affirmation of his message and of his person. Now Paul says that he is writing on behalf of himself and Timothy as well. And it would appear from this greeting that as one of Paul's co-workers and his protege, Timothy had played an important role in the establishment and the strengthening of the church at Corinth. And hence, Paul includes Timothy in this greeting. Now we notice to whom Paul gave this greeting. He says, to the church with all the saints. So we know that this letter was written to the church of Corinth, and all of the believers who were in the surrounding area. And what does he say to them? Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow, what an amazing greeting. Grace to you and peace. Paul's wish for these believers was that, was that they experience God's grace. That is, his unmerited favor. Brothers and sisters, that's what grace is. Grace is receiving something that we could never earn or merit by our efforts or our desires. It is something that is free, freely given. All of the blessings that we receive as believers are the result of God's grace. They are given to us apart from anything that we do and despite who we are. That grace is abounding in John chapter 1 and verse 16. It is surpassing in 2 Corinthians 9.14. It is glorious in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 6. And it is rich in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7. Isn't that amazing grace? Abounding, surpassing, glorious, rich. Now what does this grace do? Well, grace produces new life. We know that specifically from the scriptures. In Acts chapter 18 and verse 27, it is grace that enables a person to believe. In Ephesians 2, 5 and then 8 and 9, it says we are saved by grace. And then in 18 chapter, Acts chapter 18, verse 25, the gospel is described as grace. It is the gospel of grace. The good news is grace. And then in Romans chapter 3 and verse 24, we are justified by grace. Grace declares us righteous. And then in Romans chapter 5 and verse 15, the free gift of salvation comes by grace. Now listen to these other effects of grace. Uh, in, uh, they enable Paul to speak. Uh, gifts are given according to grace. Grace enabled Paul to write boldly. Uh, grace enriches in all speech and knowledge. Grace enables generous giving in spite of extreme poverty. We are called by grace, by God's grace. Uh, grace gives eternal comfort and a good hope. Grace strengthens. Grace gives life. Grace is given to the humble. And it is something that we grow in. Isn't that amazing? You know, I'm thinking about the hymn, Marvelous Grace. Ah, what a great hymn. 
And then listen to the distribution of this grace. To whom does this precious and wonderful gift belong? According to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 7, grace is given to each believer. Aren't you encouraged that all of these blessings are yours because, not because you earned them, because you never could. How could you ever merit and earn these things? God freely gives them to us. Now, what about peace? Having been reconciled to God by this grace, we are now recipients of his peace. I'm going to read to you from Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16 in a moment. But as we look at this verse, I want you to remember that God's throne was once a place of dread, where we as where, where, where uh, the thought of it brought to us great fear and trembling, because we know that to, to, if we were to stand before that throne, we would stand condemned. But now it's a place of blessing for us. Look at Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. God's throne, which had once been a place of dread when we were under his condemnation and wrath, is now a place of mercy because we are at peace with God through the merits of our Lord Jesus Christ. And what is the result? Well, listen to Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Oh. If any of you have ever been in a time of great suffering and have experienced that supernatural peace, you'll never forget it. It's, it's truly wonderful. But this is something that God promises to all to whom he has given grace are now at peace with him. He blesses us with that blessing of supernatural peace, guarding our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Well, that's Paul's greeting. Now let's look at Paul's blessing, and this is as far as we're going to get today. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. Now he starts with that word, blessed. We get our word eulogy from this Greek word. It means being praiseworthy. It conceived of as verbally blessed. Now, we're most um, familiar with this word in connection with funerals. A eulogy in a funeral is a tribute to the deceased for the things which made him or her praiseworthy in this life. And so Paul says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he says, blessed be. I want you to think about that little two-letter word, be. God is praiseworthy. He is always praiseworthy. There's never been a time when he hasn't been praiseworthy. See, this word be points to the unchanging nature of God. He always was, always is, and always will be praiseworthy. And why? Why is he always praiseworthy? Well, look at our passage. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. God is praiseworthy because he is the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Now, before we get to uh, these mercies and this comfort, let's think about the fact that he is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. What does that mean? What does it mean that... He is God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that word God means supreme being. And when we think of that, we should think about the, uh, a God as being all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present, perfect in every way. That is God. And then Father conveys to us the idea of origin or source. 
Now our passage says that he is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Lord Jesus Christ summarizes all of Jesus' redemptive work. As Lord, he is ruler, king, and master. And this describes his sovereignty over us as believers. We exist, we live to do his will. He is our master. He is the one who calls the shot. We are no longer in control of our lives. We serve and live to do his will. And then he is Jesus. And this comes from the Hebrew name Yeshua, which means God saves. You remember that when the angel appeared to Joseph and told him to call uh, Mary's baby Jesus, he said, for he will save his people from their sins. So Jesus describes his saving death and his life-giving resurrection. And then Christ means anointed one. Uh, the word in the Old Testament is Messiah, the one chosen by God to save his people from their sins. And this describes Jesus as the king who will defeat all of God's enemies and rule over the redeemed earth and the eternal state. So this is, our, this, is this God and Father that we're thinking about, this God of uh, comfort and Father of mercies. Now let's think for a moment about the Father of mercies. Now remember, Father means the one from whom all descendants came, the originator, if you were. And mercy means, I like to, to, to define mercy and grace this way. Maybe it's, you know, this is, don't, don't, this is my, my definition, helps me keep the two words apart. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. So everything that we have gotten in life as believers from God is by grace. We don't deserve it. God freely gives it. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. What I, don't, what I deserve is hell. That I'm getting heaven is merciful from God. God is giving me mercy. So what we deserve is death. We deserve both physical and spiritual death according to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 17. And what have we received instead as God's people? Eternal life. And having given us eternal life, God then gives us every good thing. Isn't that amazing? Romans 8, 31 and 32 echoes this thought. It says, what, shall we, shall, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Isn't that a wonderful question? How will he not graciously give us all things since he's given us his one and only son? Brothers and sisters, all that is good in our lives comes from our kind, gracious, and merciful Father. Listen to what James 1.17 says. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. So, this is our God. He is the Father of mercies. Now, as we think about God being Father, there are a few other things that tell us about uh, this, uh, who he is as our father. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 17, God is the father of glory. It teaches us that he is glorious and that uh, all that is glorious derives its glory from him. God is the father of spirits, according to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 9. He is the source and the giver of life. And then in James 1.17, God is the father of lights. He doesn't change in that context. There is no variation or shifting shadow when it comes to our God. He does not change. Contrast all of this with Satan, who is called the father of lies. All lies, all that is untrue, all that is false, all that is deceptive or fraudulent, find their origin in Satan himself. Well, that's, the, that's our Father of mercies. What, a, what an amazing Father we have, right? 
And then he is the God of all comfort. Now remember that God means the supreme being, the one who is all-powerful, all-knowing, everywhere present, and perfect in every way. And, and who is this God? He is the God of comfort, and this means consolation in time of disappointment. Whenever we are disappointed, God is our comfort. And I think it's very important that he is described as the God of all comfort. If there was anyone who could provide comfort no matter what the circumstance, it is God. All of us have faced situations where we're trying to be a comfort for, to someone else and we just feel at a loss. We don't know what to do. We don't know what to say. We stand there silent, fearful, wishing we could do something, but feeling so inadequate. Brothers and sisters, that's never true of our God. Because he knows everything, because he's ever uh, uh, present everywhere at all times and has all power, there is never a situation in your life or mine where God cannot and will not comfort us. Because he is omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent, there is never a time nor a place nor a situation where God is unable to help us in our time of need. Isn't that, a, isn't that an encouragement? You know, I would encourage you this afternoon to read Psalm 139. It tells us about the fact that Psalm just goes over and over again about how there's no place that we can go where we can escape God's presence. He is always there. He, we are always in his presence. And brothers and sisters, if we are children of God, that's a good place to be. We need to remember that we may be able to gain comfort from other sources some of the time. But only God is able to provide all comfort all of the time. No matter what our circumstances might be, God is able to to comfort us. And I, I'm just going to read for you Psalm 46 because I think it's so such a good psalm in light of the trials and troubles that we're going through at this time. You know, as we face this virus and all of the uncertainty, all the death that is happening in the world, uh, trying to make sense of uh, good news from fake news, uh, we need to hear this message. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way. Huh, amazing. I, I, I don't think I, any of us have seen that yet, right? The earth falling away. Though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, there is a river whose streams may glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come. Behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. And then these words that we are so familiar with. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is is our fortress. You know, right at the very beginning, it says God is our refuge and strength. Right in the middle, it says the Lord of hosts is with us, and then it concludes the Lord of hosts is with us. Do you think God is trying to communicate something to us in this precious psalm, brothers and sisters? Don't be afraid. Our God of comfort and our Father of mercies is ready and willing to help sustain us in all our ways. But we, even if the earth were to fall into the sea, we would not need to be afraid. And may that be our cry this morning. Lord, I trust you. Lord, I believe in you. 
Lord, comfort me, strengthen me, and give me that grace to rest in you. Our Father, we thank you for your precious word this morning. Lord, what an amazing thing that you have chosen to reveal yourself to us as a God of all comfort. Father, how great, how grateful we are to know that there is nothing, nothing in this world that can stop you from comforting us, no matter what our circumstances. And then to embrace the fact that you are the Father, our Father of mercies. Lord, you are one who does not give us what we deserve. Oh, how thankful we are that you are merciful toward us. Father, we think about these scriptures that tell us that your mercies are new every day. Father, even as we see all of the bad news happening around us, we thank you that your mercies are new every day. And Father, we pray for our world. Lord, we know that one of the reasons why these troubles and trials are brought upon our world is to warn them. To warn them of a day that is coming that is going to be a far greater disaster than a little virus. Father, a circumstance that is awaiting that has a 100% mortality rate for all who do not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, how we pray, our Father, that you would be pleased to save sinners. That you would use this virus to glorify your name by bringing many into your kingdom. And Father, we pray that you would give us grace to be salt and light to our friends, our family, and our neighbors. To be bold in our witness, trusting, O oh Lord, that you will use these difficult times to bring many into your kingdom. So, Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for its encouragement. And Lord, give us grace to be faithful representatives of you to our world in these difficult days. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now Joel's going to come and lead us in a final song of praise. Well, I hope you have been encouraged uh, this morning. Um, don't know what the week's going to be like. Don't know how long we're going to be having to stay home. But it's okay. Because this hymn that I have uh, been playing um, to myself this week has just given me such comfort. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. And I hope that that is your comfort as well. Let me just sing with me. Mm -hmm. God sent his son, they called him Jesus, he came to I'll see. 
precious name. Amen. Well, have a great, safe week, everyone, and please stay home. We love you, and uh, we'll see you again soon.